Someday soon, my Savior will call out my name. Hello, everyone. I'm glad you're here tonight. I hope this Bible class is a blessing to you. You can get your King James Bible in your hand, and if not, a piece of paper and a, and a pen and write down the scriptures that we use, but turn to Acts chapter 17. We're going to look at Acts chapter 17, verse 31. For uh, just a moment, I mean verse um, uh, 30 and 31 for just a moment, uh, and then we're going to move on to some other things. I want to talk to you tonight and next week both about a phrase that Paul the Apostle used. Since Paul the Apostle was the Apostle of the Gentiles, and since he was writing to the church, the body of Christ, seven times, um, this is the eighth one, but seven times he uses the phrase, but now, and it's in relationship to the church. In other words, the but now would be not before, but now, and go on. As a matter of fact, one of the ways you can identify a timeline of the Bible is if you're looking at it on the basis of time past, which would be like what we call the Old Testament, and the time in which Jesus Christ was upon the earth here, and then but now, which is the time frame that the body of Christ is, is upon the earth, and that's now, and then... Uh, uh, things to come, and I'll just put to come here because you could put wrath to come, you could put things to come, you could put several book, several uh, uh, phrases that that work well for the idea of what is yet in coming from the Lord in the Holy Scripture. So you learn things in the Bible on the basis of time past, but now, or what is yet to come, wrath to come, uh, tribulation to come, thousand year reign to come. So all of that's out in the future. Now, my point about all that is if you look in Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul is in a place where it's rather strange. He's in Athens, and he's in Athens for the express purpose of dealing with their idolatry. He saw the city wholly given to idolatry, and he sought to talk with them about the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want you to look with me in verse... And I said we're, we're going we're to look at verse 30 and 31, but I want to actually start in verse... Um, 29, Paul says, and this is in the middle of a speech that Paul gives, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Well, if we ought not to think of it like that, then we ought not to have gold, silver, stone graven by art and man's device depicting God or somebody like a God. What would be the point? We ought not to think of God that way. It's what Paul says. And yet, Paul says there was a time when God didn't mind that so much because he knew who the people were, verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. To repent means to turn around, to change, to walk away from or to turn away from. To change the way of thinking, to change the way of doing, to change the way of going. Repent. You can use repent for any purpose, uh, for any person, anywhere at any time. If they change their mind, change where they're going, change what they're doing. Uh, it repenteth God that he ever made man. And God repented more than once in the Bible. So when somebody says the word repent, it is most often in evangelical terms supposed, supposed to be, supposedly to be about sins. Well, maybe it is, but then maybe it's about God changing his mind. Wow. Repenting. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent, in this case, of the idolatrous practice that you just read of in verse 29. He says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now, but now, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now that phrase, but now, is for the people who were hearing this, for Paul, the apostle, it would have been when he changed in Acts chapter 9. He didn't even know he was an idolater until it was pointed out to him that Jesus Christ is the Lord from heaven. I mean, he was, he was worshiping that system that the Jews had. He was in the middle of it, trying to kill people who believed in Jesus, remember? He repented. But, and for Paul, the but now would have been back then in Acts chapter 9. But for these people here in Athens, the but now in which God commandeth all men everywhere to repent, for them would have been right here in Acts chapter 17, verse 30. So it is with many of us. 
I was saved when I was 22 in 1964, and I did what my daddy had taught me to do when you, when you become a Christian. You, do, you go join the church and you do whatever the church says, and on and on it went. Well, I did that. And it was nine years before I found out by the Scripture that I did not need to be doing the, some of the things that I was doing, and I should have been doing other things which I was not doing. So what did I do? That was my butt now. When I was 20, uh, 22 and trusted Christ as my Savior, that was simple gospel. That was simple salvation. But when I was 31 and read the Scripture, what I was then was changed. But now... And I walked away from most of the things that I could see at that time were the wrong thing to be doing. So I want to talk to you about seven more passages of Scripture in the rest of this Bible class tonight and next week on the television station next week, same time. I'll be talking about the same thing, and the phrase is, but now. Turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. This is a biggie. You might as well start the things off with a biggie, right? I mean... Let's get the big points in first. In Romans chapter 16, Paul writes this after some 25, 27 years of of ministry, something like that. And he writes it, but he's revealing things here to the Romans as if for the first time. In other words, when you read it, when you go from left to right in your Bible, you come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. And that's the first book Paul wrote. And when Paul wrote Romans, he takes eight chapters to describe what the gospel of Christ is. Covers a lot of ground, covers a lot of areas. A couple of them we'll be talking about again uh, more here. But he's describing the gospel of Christ in eight chapters. Eight, half the book is to describe the gospel of Christ. And then from 12 to uh, 15 or so, it's all about what you're doing with your life. And as, he, and as he comes to an end here of this book, he says, verse 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest. To the Romans it would have been this gospel that Paul preached the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began to the Roman church it would have been the first eight chapters when he explained that gospel of Christ perhaps to you it is right here perhaps there was a day in your life maybe you were like me perhaps there was a day in your life when you trusted Christ as your Savior you believed he died for your sins you believed he could save you and you didn't have any place to turn to and you gave up on yourself in other words you didn't try to save yourself and you trusted what Christ did for you that's the case and you had never before heard that the gospel which Paul preached was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest then maybe right now tonight in this bible class maybe that's your but now you ever heard that before again middle of verse 25 the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest When did you first know that the gospel which saved you, the one that's able to establish you, Paul calls it my gospel three times. When did you know that it is a revealed mystery which was kept secret since the world began? On this timeline, way back here's where the world began. You go 4,034 years before you ever get to this but now. Nobody knew the gospel of Christ until the Apostle Paul received it. How do I know that? Go to Galatians chapter 1. Look in Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, he says, this is what he's preaching. He says in verse 6, to these Galatians, who were sort of a hard-headed bunch of people. Mm, I'm not saying you're hard-headed, you understand But here, he says in verse 6, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He brings in that word gospel. Then in verse 7, he says, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. In Romans 1, 16, he said, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And he calls it my gospel, as I said, three times. 
And the but now of Romans 16 is all about, oh, now we know the gospel of Christ. Look at verse 11. I'm sorry, 12. Ah, still wrong. 11. Galatians 1, 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me, that would be the gospel of Christ that Paul always preached, is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you see that he got this gospel directly from the Lord Jesus Christ? In describing it, he said, For I delivered, uh, first of all, unto you, I'm sorry, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, that he was raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. That is the gospel of Christ. He said, I delivered it unto you first because I got it first. I don't think I did any harm there. I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, that in me first Jesus Christ should show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Was Paul the first one saved with that gospel? Yes, he was. Did you hear that? Yes, he was. Go tell your preacher that. Paul was the first one saved by the gospel of Christ. If you go to church regularly, you ask him if that's true. First Timothy 1.16. Don't go there now, but uh, write that down on your piece of paper. Look it up. Read it over and over and over. That in me first, in me first. It was Paul first? Said he was. It's in Scripture that he was first. You really wouldn't argue with Scripture, would you? Hope not. So Paul says, but now. Now go back to Romans 16. In other words, he's got this gospel. It's a, the revelation of a mystery, which had been kept secret since the world began. And then he says in verse 26, but now is made manifest. Now watch what else he says. And by the scriptures of the prophets, that would be everything prior to Paul's writing. Prior to in the Bible. You can pretty well say that. The book of Acts had not yet been written, so it wouldn't be the book of Acts. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all of the Old Testament. He says, But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Please notice, it is not the gospel of Christ made known to all nations. I'm sorry. It's not the gospel of Christ which is in the scriptures that he revealed because he had a commandment to do so. No, he had a commandment by the scriptures. See watch what it says. But now is made manifest that, that secret gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. That gospel was not necessarily in the Scriptures, but now is made manifest and by the Scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Was it in the Old Testament? No. Could you prove it by the Old Testament? Yes. You can prove the gospel of Christ by the Old Testament because you have it revealed to, through, and by the Apostle Paul. If Paul had never revealed it, it would not have been seen in Scripture. You have to think about that a moment. The Scripture that he's referring to here is not for you to find the Gospel. It's for you to use the Scripture to back up what the Gospel says. How that Christ died for our sins. You see, he was delivered to the cross. He was delivered for our offenses. <clears throat> You can't find that in the Old Testament. You can find him dying in the Old Testament, being delivered up for the sins of Israel. Isaiah 53. Wounded for our transgressions, Isaiah said. Well, you're probably not an Israelite. So it was a mystery that he could save Gentiles. But the Gentiles had a promise in the Old Testament, and so... If he's going to be saving uh, Gentiles by the gospel of Christ, and you went back to the Old Testament, and you can mark this down, Isaiah 42 through 49, he says the word Gentiles, or strangers, or aliens, or uh, those of the isles, which all of those terms refer to Gentiles. In Isaiah 42 through 49, there's 156 mentions of them. 
You think they had any hope in the Old Testament? Of course they did. But they didn't have the gospel of Christ as a hope. They had Israel as a hope. The Gentiles could come to Israel. Again, in Isaiah 61, 2 and 3, many times, Israel is taking in the Gentiles. In fact, they're taking everything they've got in the, in the context. But their Gentiles are coming to Israel. That's a hope for Gentiles. In the first 25 years or so of Paul's ministry, that's where he found Gentiles, sitting in synagogues, connected to the Jews. But the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation, was not in the Old Testament. But by the preaching of the gospel of Christ, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it's probably right on the next page in your Bible, look at it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, look at the second half of the verse. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So here comes a Gentile, and he's friends with a Jew, and the Jew takes him to the synagogue, and he hears about God, about the coming Messiah, about the law of Moses, all the way from the Old Testament. Along comes the Apostle Paul, and he's in the synagogue, and there's this Jew who brought a Gentile, and they're sitting there in the, in the synagogue, and they're listening to Paul speak, and Paul says how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Immediately, in those days, he wouldn't have been able to do this, but he would, if he had one like you have it, a little black book on the table, he'd be flipping back here trying to find that gospel. He wouldn't find the gospel. He would find a way that Gentiles could get saved by being associated with Jews, though. And so he would have to give it up. Here stands a Jew, Paul, preaching the gospel of Christ. that He, he, he said he got it directly from Jesus Christ. And it goes to, first to the Jew and also to the Gentile. You've got Scripture to back that up. That's what the but now is made manifest is all about in Romans 16, verse 26. But now is made manifest. And by the Scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. What is made manifest? A secret, kept secret since the world began, which is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and what they could tell by that preaching is that they could go to the Old Testament and prove that every nation should hear it. And that's what verse 26 is all about. Well, that establishes something for you and me. We probably never went to a Jewish synagogue. We never sat down because a Jew invited us to come and sit down and hear preaching. Probably not. Hasn't happened much in America, you know. But nevertheless, we still get to hear. So the but nows of the Apostle Paul are very applicable to you and I. Very much so. Notice one of them. Go back to Romans chapter 3. I told you that in the first eight chapters of Romans, it was an explanation of the gospel of Christ, right? Well, look here, right smack in the middle of it in, verse, in chapter 3. Start with me in verse, uh, look first in verse 9. What then are we, he's referencing Jews there, better than they, that, the word they is Gentiles. No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Every one of those phrases in verse 10 and 11 and 12, every one of those phrases are from the Old Testament. The Jews did not believe that. But Paul told the Romans that they were Gentiles. He said in Romans chapter 11, verse 13, I speak to you Gentiles. So it's true, Jew or Gentile, all under sin, none righteous, nobody's any good. That means you ain't no good. It means your kids ain't no good. It means your grandkids ain't no good, and that probably makes some of you mad. It means your mom and dad wasn't any good, and some of you would say, well, I remember that. But nevertheless, it's not about history. It's not, we are all in the same boat. Verse 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay? So, look down now at verse 19. Now, we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Do you see how everybody's guilty? The law catches everybody. 
verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, that would be the doing them when he said do them, and to not do them when he said don't do them. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, there's our second but now, but now, the righteousness of God, that's pretty righteous. God's righteousness is that he is never wrong. Well, he wrote that law, the law called the law of Moses. And in the writing of that law, he was not wrong. He was exactly right. Sometime in your spare time, probably next tomorrow morning between 9.30 and 10, you can pick up a Bible and just read from Exodus chapter 19 all the way through the book of Deuteronomy. It won't take you long. I'm just kidding. It'll take you a long time. Stand up and read it out loud if you really want to get it. Otherwise, you'll fall asleep on it. Look at verse 20, uh, 21. But now, the righteousness of God without the law. Get the terminology. It's without the law. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now watch verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there's no difference. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is by faith of Jesus Christ. And it's unto all, but it's only upon the righteousness of God now. It's only upon all them that believe. Do you understand? It is upon all them that believe. So you hear, the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 12, 13, 14, you hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You believe it, that Christ died for you, paid the price. And you trust Christ as your Savior. And the Bible was on to say right there that you are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise unto the day of redemption. What a position to be in. But now, the righteousness of God without the law comes to you by faith of Jesus Christ. Not faith in Jesus Christ, although you do exercise faith in Jesus Christ at the time of your salvation because He's your only hope. But it comes to you by the faith of Jesus Christ. He exercised faith, folks. A man said the other day on Facebook, as a, I think it was even a sermon title, I can't remember for sure, that Jesus Christ did not have to have faith. Oh, yes, He did. The Bible says the faith of Christ seven times, and any version that changes it to faith in Christ is speaking redundantly, and God would never speak redundantly. God speaks literally and grammatically correctly. The faith of Jesus Christ is the faith of Christ. And everybody that's ever been saved has been saved because of the faith of Christ. Christ went to that cross saying unto the Father, Not my will, but thine be done. In His flesh, He said, If there's another way, let's use the other way. The Lord said, They ain't got no other way. He went to that cross. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He did that and died on purpose. And He died for you and for me. Because he had the faith to believe that three days and three nights later, God the Father was going to raise him from the dead. You see, he had written down, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. He didn't sin. So how come he died? My sin was upon him, as was yours. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them. How did God get into Christ? God was in Christ from age 30 on. When the Spirit descended as like a dove descends and covered Him, God Almighty was in Him. He told Philip, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. People say, well, it's Jesus of Nazareth. The crowd said it was Jesus of Nazareth. God the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. In whom I'm well pleased. God was glad to be here. You see that but now gets big there in verse 21 then, doesn't it? But now the righteousness of God, 
without the law, even, verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe. That is magnificent, folks. Magnificent. Now I want you to look at another one real close by over in chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, verse 5, still in the long explanation of the gospel of Christ, Romans chapter 7, verse 5 says, For when we were in the flesh... What? Yeah, I said, when we were in the flesh. You'll have to get that out of Romans chapter 6 to understand that. We'll get back to that one probably next Sunday. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law. That being dead, wherein we were held. What was it that killed us? It was the law. I said, well, no, it was sin that killed us. Yes, but if you hadn't, you hadn't, didn't have the law, you wouldn't know, wouldn't have known you sinned, would you? So there's sin, but the law killed you. The law made it a capital offense. That sin. And so he says, but now we are delivered from the law. So well, we still die. Nah. That's just the flesh that dies. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you were crucified, buried, and resurrected with Him in A.D. 33. If you never trust Christ as your Savior, you weren't there. But if you do trust Christ as your Savior, you were there, crucified, buried, and resurrected with Him. You can count on it. That's a fact. So he says, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the latter. We don't need to, uh, we don't, it isn't that we should never read the law. You can read the law if you want to. But all of these people back here who were under the law, they needed to know the letter of the law lest they break the commandment. It isn't about whether or not you break the commandment. The deal with you and me is we do break the commandment. We don't break them all. You know, law of the land puts you in jail for a bunch of them. But the law of the land wouldn't put you in jail for all of them. But God would count it as unrighteous if he were still accounting you to the law. But if you're in Christ, he doesn't count you in the law. The law is dead to you. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held. What a marvelous position to be in for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a marvelous way it is to be in Christ. Back up one chapter to chapter 6. And I want to, this. This is going to be have to be a little short here, but I, we'll probably start right here next week. But right now, he says in verse 17, talking about saved people, he says, "But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, which would be his explanation of the gospel of Christ. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness." So the idea is that if you become free from sin and become the servants of righteousness, the things that you're doing are things which belong to the Lord. He is all righteousness. But notice now, verse uh, 20, For when uh, you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Then he says, But now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, but now being free from sin means that if you have li eternal life through Jesus Christ, you are free from that sin. In other words, the sin isn't there anymore when it comes to you serving the Lord. You don't serve the Lord on the basis of how well you keep His law. You serve the Lord on the basis of how well you understand what His doctrine is for today and keep it. So he says, but now, being made free from sin, you become servants unto God. It is a marvelous thing that you can become a servant of the God of heaven and earth. And you only can do that because Christ died for your sins like he died for mine. And you one day, if you have not already, right now will be a great time to establish in your heart and mind trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I thank you for being with us tonight. I hope you'll be back next week for another Bible class finishing up the phrases, but now in Paul's epistles. Good night, everybody. Someday soon I